and welcome to The Scope with Dr. K. I'm Dr. Kaczynski and would like to open our show today, as I always do, by reminding everyone that the goal of this series is to present you a broad scope of value-based care issues, mainly involving the field of gastroenterology, but outside of GI as well. In each episode, we plan to bring you cutting-edge information through a focused interview with an influential and interesting key opinion leader. Our guest today is a longtime friend of mine and colleague, Harold Miller, who is the CEO of the Center for Healthcare Quality and Payment Reform and has been a true leader in developing models for healthcare payment and delivery reform. He has twice been invited to provide expert testimony to Congress on how to reform healthcare payments and has worked in more than 40 states and several foreign countries to help physicians, hospitals, employers, health plans, and government agencies design and implement payment and delivery system reforms. Good morning, Harold. Hi, Larry. Thanks for inviting me. Well, the honor is all ours. So why don't we start out by you telling us about the Center for Healthcare Quality and Payment Reform, what's its mission, what have you accomplished with this organization? Well, I started the center in 2008. We've really done, I guess, three kinds of things. One is education. Uh, in the earliest stages, it was educating people about the problems that the payment system created to getting higher quality, higher value healthcare. Then education about what kinds of alternative payment models um, would potentially solve that, and more recently, um, uh, overcoming some of the challenges involved in getting good payment models. Second thing we've done is technical assistance, working with a number of medical specialty societies, hospital associations, employer groups on how to actually put these models into play. And the third is facilitation in uh, various communities, bringing physicians, hospitals, employers, health plans together to try to reach consensus about what to do and how to get it done. Let's turn now to the PTAC. Uh, this is an entity that was close to my heart as SonarMD was actually the first approved physician-focused payment model uh, back in April of uh, 2017. You were an initial member of the PTAC, Harold. Um, what was its initial aspirations? Well, as you mentioned, Larry, Congress created PTAC um, uh, back when it passed the MACRA law. And while a lot of people think MACRA is associated only with MIPS and quality bonuses and penalties, Congress, if you read the law, it was clear that Congress wanted to encourage and facilitate the ability of physicians to participate in different kinds of uh, payment models. And Congress at that stage was frustrated that they had created the um, uh, CMS Innovation Center and that there really were almost no payment models developed that physicians could participate in. So PTAC was created to try to encourage that, to give uh, physicians and, and medical special societies uh, an opportunity to come in and bring in models and have them reviewed by uh, the PTAC group, which is a, a group of 11 people from around the country that were appointed by the GAO to serve on this and make recommendations to the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and so the idea was it, was, it was something of an experiment initially in terms of would anybody actually bring in proposals like that? And we were all, um, I think, both pleased and even a little amazed at how many proposals that came in and how quickly they came in. We were, um, uh, began accepting uh, uh, um, proposals in December of 2016, and we got three in the first month, including one from you, um, uh, which showed that there was really a pent-up demand uh, for that, and lots of really good ideas and different ideas and different approaches than anything that CMS or uh, other health plans had been doing at the time. Absolutely. So what actually happened at the PTAC, Harold? We got over 30 proposals. 
um, which was a very impressive because uh, it's a lot of work in putting together those proposals and a lot of um, hard questions from the PTAC. We recommended 16 of those proposals be implemented or tested by the Department of Human, Health and Human Services, and not a single one has been uh, implemented. Um, in fact, uh, CMS has said that they don't intend to ever implement any of them. They want, they at best will take what they think may be some good ideas out of the proposals and try to incorporate them into uh, their own models. Um, and um, I, I, many of the PTAC members have been very frustrated by that. I and two other members resigned from the PTAC last fall, really in protest over that because I'll speak for myself, I was concerned that we were actually misleading physicians um, who were bringing in proposals with the idea that they might be able to get approved. And uh, the fact that we were continuing to work on them, uh, I think was misleading. And I was also very concerned that CMS had started to claim that the models that they were announcing themselves had been developed with input from PTAC, which was absolutely false. In fact, we had been told that we were not allowed to provide input to uh, CMS. So I think it's been um, unfortunate, a success in terms of being able to attract good proposals, a failure in terms of being able to actually get things implemented. And I hope that uh, Congress, whenever things get a little bit back to normal, will actually try to uh, fix that. Cause I think it's only gonna get fixed with appropriate congressional action. Wow. This, this is a big problem that is going to require bipartisan consensus to move forward. So, yes, and it was well, a, and thank you for PTAC was a bipartisan initiative, one of the few bipartisan yeah. initiatives. And I think there is still bipartisan initiative interest in, in making it work. So I'm hopeful that there will be some solutions in the near future. Harold, one of the things that one of the components of your view of the future has to do with how hospitals are compensated. I sat on a hospital board for many years, and they still live around putting, and the term is putting butts in the vet, uh, filling up those hospital rooms. Also, just about every hospital around will tell you that they lose money on Medicare, and the only profits they generate are from the commercial side. You have a unique model for how hospitals could be compensated in the future. And I think the listeners would love to hear this. Well, the challenge that hospitals face, and I think we're seeing this um, really dramatically uh, today in, in the coronavirus era, is that what you, the most fundamental thing that you want a hospital to do is to be there if you need it, when you need it, but not to need it. Um, so you want to have a hospital with an emergency room that's there if you have an emergency, but you hope that you won't have an emergency. The problem is we only pay the hospital for the emergency room for people who have emergencies. So it ends up being the hospital has a, a, a pretty significant standby cost to be able to be there for patients who need it, but they only get paid when patients come. So hospitals, it's no surprise, hospitals try to encourage people to come to their emergency department because if in fact people didn't have accidents and didn't have emergencies, the hospital would go bankrupt. And we're seeing that in the coronavirus pandemic because we're, what we're suddenly realizing is in the case of a pandemic, you need significant hospital capacity available to be able to deal with that kind of a surge during an epidemic but we don't pay hospitals to do that. No hospital gets any money to simply be there and have the capacity available to have extra ventilators and extra masks and extra emergency room capacity if such a thing would happen. They only get paid whenever they do things. Um, so naturally, hospitals have ended up investing most of their effort in terms of building uh, lines of business that where people will come and generate extra revenues for them with extra hip and knee surgeries and other kinds of procedures, because that's the only way they can sustain those other, those other standby uh, services. And I think there's a very different way to pay for that. We should actually be paying for standby capacity. So we should say that we're gonna pay hospitals 
an amount based on how many people there are in the community to have adequate emergency room capacity for that, an adequate cardiac um, uh, stenting capability for people who have heart attacks, an adequate stroke treatment capacity for people who have strokes, because those are things that you want to have available instantaneously when someone needs it, but it costs a lot of money to have services available instantaneously. It's a very odd situation because we certainly, we would never, no one would ever think about paying a fire department the way we pay hospitals. You wouldn't say you're going to pay the fire department based on how many fires there are. And so if people don't have fires, the fire department will go bankrupt. And you certainly wouldn't want to encourage the fire department to become arsonists and go out and start setting fires so that they could sustain the fire department. But that's exactly what we do with hospitals. We tell them we're only going to pay you if you actually have emergencies. So there's a natural tendency to say, let's get as many people, hospitals advertise their waiting time at the emergency department. I was once in an emergency room with uh, my wife and her aunt, her elderly aunt, who had very high blood pressure. We took her to the emergency room at a hospital in Florida. And while I was waiting, there was a sign on the wall in the emergency room saying, next time, call ahead for an appointment. But emergency rooms have ended up becoming simply the way to deliver all care and the entry to hospital services. So I think we have to really fundamentally change the way we pay hospitals, as well as physicians, um, if we're going to be able to achieve the kinds of lower cost and higher quality care um, uh, that we want. I, I first, I mean, one other aspect of hospitals, I first got involved in the whole issue of payment reform because I was looking at the issue of hospital acquired infections. And an organization that I was doing some work with had been able to literally eliminate hospital acquired infections in uh, hospital ICU, something that no one thought was possible. Um, and they were having trouble getting hospitals to implement it. And what I discovered when I looked at it was that if a hospital prevents hospital acquired infections, particularly central line associated bloodstream infections, they lose a huge amount of money because of the way they're paid. And I was just stunned at the idea that if hospitals helped avoid infections, they would lose money. That was such a perverse way to pay them that I started working on healthcare payment reform. Because in fact, if you look across healthcare in many, many, many places, the higher quality care actually ends up causing losses for the physicians and hospitals. If you're just tuning in, this is The Scope with Dr. K. I'm Dr. Kaczynski, and I am interviewing Harold Miller. Harold, I'd like you to give us a little bit more uh, detail around that payment concept for hospitals. So if I understand this correctly, you're saying that based upon a certain population that the hospital is responsible for and accountable for, I like that word that you used earlier, they would receive some type of a base payment on an ongoing basis. That's on right. top of that, though, would they not be compensated for, let's say, if a lot more services are required? Yes. But, but so the idea is today we give them no base payment at all, and we pay them entirely based on whether they actually see a patient or deal with an emergency or a heart attack. You wouldn't want to go to the other extreme, which is to say we're simply going to give them a pot of money, and then they have to try to make that work because, in fact, if you had a pandemic or other problems, the costs do go up. What you want to do is, is have a mix that basically you're paying for the essential fixed costs of the hospital. That fundamental capacity they need, you should pay based on the population of the community that they're serving. If they're serving a bigger community, they need a bigger emergency department. Um, uh, if, if they're serving a smaller community, they don't need as big an emergency department. And then every time they have an emergency, you would be paying them based on essentially the variable cost associated with an additional visit. That, that avoids the problem that we have today, that if you have more visits, you make huge profits. And if you have fewer visits, you have huge losses if you pay the hospital based on the mix of their fixed and variable costs, you, they end up being able to cover their costs regardless of what the volume is. Then they can say, if we keep people healthy and they don't need to come to the emergency room, 
we're still adequately compensated to keep the emergency room available for emergencies, but we don't lose money because fewer people come into the emergency department. Now, if the hospital then wants to offer elective procedures to do outpatient surgeries, et cetera, they should charge for that exactly what everybody else charges. There's no need to pay the hospital more to do something that could be done in an ambulatory surgery center or even in a physician office because the hospital isn't having to do that to subsidize other aspects of their operations um, where they lose money. But that's the argument that hospitals make, rightly so today, is that they need to be paid more for everything that they do because the hospitals incur costs that they don't get paid for. Well, the solution to that is to pay them more for everything. The solution to that is to pay them for those costs that they incur, that we want them to incur, to have capacity available to help us whenever there is a major, major you know, transportation incident in the community or a pandemic or whatever the problem is. You want that capacity there, but you shouldn't then have the hospital profiting or losing based on whether or not that occurs. I have, I have loved this model every time I've heard you uh, speak of it, and it would be applicable, as you have said, to the physician space as well. When we look at a gastroenterology practice, over 80% of the revenue that's generated by a gastroenterology practice is generated through the performance of elective colonoscopies for screening purposes. These doctors go through extensive training, six years of training, some of them after medical school. They pass board exams where they can take care of just about every single illness uh, in, a G, in the GI space. And yet they get paid to do one repetitive procedure over and over and over again. And as a result, the complex conditions, the conditions that they should be able to take care of, are looked upon as distractions from their sources of income, which are being provided in the ambulatory surgery centers. So the same type of model could be applied to the specialist practice. I, I could see very definite ways of doing that. Absolutely, and I think particularly where you really need that is in rural communities because one of the biggest care gaps in rural communities is difficulty in accessing specialists. Many rural communities have trouble even attracting primary care physicians, but they have particular problems attracting specialists because you would like the people in the rural community to be able to get their screening colonoscopies, right? But on the other hand, it doesn't make sense if you're paying the gastroenterologist based on how many colonoscopies they do, there's not going to be enough colonoscopies to be able to pay them. But so the choice is the patient, patient gets no colonoscopy because they're going to have to travel 50 miles to be able to get a gastroenterologist. The, the, the middle ground would be to say, let's actually support specialists to locate in those communities um, and to be able to do those things. And the gastroenterologist then, rather than spending all of their time just doing colonoscopies, can also help people in the community with other gastrointestinal illnesses and manage inflammatory bowel disease or whatever, which would be very difficult for a busy, overworked primary care physician to do in some of those, um, some of those communities. And what happens in many communities um, that enables them to have specialists is, guess what, the hospital, the community hospital, Right. hires the specialist and subsidizes them. What do they, if they subsidize the specialist, what are they doing? They're doing exactly what we just talked about. They're providing the core funding to be able to have that specialist locate in the community and provide services to the community. But it ends up being then that the hospital has to charge more for everything it does in order to have the money to pay the specialist right. so that the community can have the specialist. Wouldn't it make a whole lot more sense to simply say, what kind of capacity do we need to have in the community? Let's pay for that directly rather than have all of this cross subsidization going on. Makes a lot of sense to me. I'm gonna switch, you, you did mention that we are right now taping this in the throes of a COVID-19 virus. Yes. Um, and we're all starting to think about what life is going to be life, like after this has passed, after there's a solution. I've used the analogy that the COVID-19 virus is like an F5 tornado destroying healthcare 
and exposing its glaring flaws. Just like in a small town that gets devastated by a tornado, when that town is rebuilt, it's not rebuilt the same way it was before the tornado destroyed it. You and I have discussed over the last few days principles that you would like to see followed when when healthcare is rebuilt, and I'd love to hear you um, detail them to the audience. Well, first of all, I would say I think you're somewhat more optimistic that after disasters, people try to rebuild things the way they should be built. I think that in all too many cases, people simply try to bring back what was there before rather than actually taking the time and effort to be able to rethink it. And oftentimes the disaster rebuilding needs to occur so quickly that people simply go by the playbook they know. And I think that one of the challenges I think we will face in in the post-pandemic rebuilding is whether people simply try to get back as quickly as possible to the old way of doing things or whether it becomes an opportunity to be able to do things differently. I think the fact that some of these different payment models and delivery model approaches um, have been developed provides a potential blueprint for doing some things differently. But I think it starts with people recognizing that part of the reason we had a problem during the pandemic was because of the way we paid before. And I'm not sure yet that a lot of people recognize that. They see it as a temporary severe problem. We need to provide loans or grants to be able to get get past it, and then we'll go back to the way things were before, rather than recognizing that the reason why hospitals and physician practices are having such difficulty now is because there was no funding, stable funding, to sustain the core capacity, and so much of their funding was dependent on elective procedures, which then disappeared in the middle of the pandemic and that there wasn't any way to support the surge capacity that was needed during the pandemic. So rather than simply saying, okay, that's gone now, now we can go back to the way things were before, hopefully we will recognize that problems existed that led us to have those things be worse than they would have been otherwise and that we should try to fix them. But I think that's gonna take a lot of education. I think it's gonna take a lot of advocacy by Uh, physicians and hospitals who do see uh, what should be done differently um, in order to make sure that we actually do make that transition. One of the things that we discussed was the unfortunate situation that develops when a working person with insurance that's purchased by their employer gets furloughed and loses their, not only loses their job and their income, but may also lose their health care coverage. I was intrigued with your concepts as to comparisons to Medicare and Social Security and how you visioned a solution for this. Well, you know, I think people, the difficulty is people can't pull the parts apart. Um, So, you know, people get employer-sponsored insurance but there's a difference between the employer contributing to your insurance and the employer buying your insurance for you. So the problem is today, your employer buys your insurance for you, and if you lose your job, you lose your insurance, as opposed to simply losing the employer contribution to that insurance that you could potentially pay yourself. And there is no provision for them. I mean, insurance plans are delaying premiums for some of their insured members, but they have to still be on beyond the plan. I mean, if you think about it, Medicare is actually employer-sponsored insurance because if you're working, there's a deduction from your pay to contribute to the Medicare trust fund. Um, You could have the same thing for uh, employer-sponsored insurance. There could be a deduction from your pay to pay for your own health insurance plan that then you would pick and keep over time rather than switching every year if you you change uh, jobs. So I think... That, that would enable that, but, but moreover, if you think about where insurance started, the very first insurance plan ever, health insurance plan ever, was Blue Cross. And the original Blue Cross plan was simply prepaid hospital care because people were concerned that if they had to have go to the hospital, they wouldn't be able to afford it. And so hospitals, starting with a hospital in Texas, started 
to allow people to prepay for their health care. Now, that's actually what I was just talking about a minute ago in terms of being able to give the hospital basically stable funding from their community. Um, and so if you say, let's, let's, instead of people buying insurance, let's have people start prepaying for their health care. So in a sense, it's more of a savings plan than buying insurance because your col the colonoscopies that we just discussed isn't insurance. You know you're going to need colonoscopy, screening colonoscopies after age 50. So it's not insurance to pay for that. You simply need to have saved money to be able to pay for the health care that you need. So I think we can rethink what insurance is in a way that will provide more stability for individuals so that they can be assured that they will be able to access health care regardless of whether they're employed or not, and will provide greater stability for the providers of healthcare who aren't dependent on whether or not their patients happen to be employed that day and happen to have an insurance plan. Well, thank you, Harold. Thank you uh, for our audience for tuning in. You can all learn more about the show on the program's page on healthcarenowradio.com and lend your voice to the conversation on Twitter at hashtag HCN Now Radio, and you can also follow us at Sonar MD. I'm Dr. Kaczynski. We're bringing patients, providers, and payers together to reimagine GI care. Until next time, I'm Dr. Kaczynski.